Want to see a giant woolly mammoth roaming the earth again? How about strange obscure birds? Keep watching to learn all about extinct animals that science wants to bring back. Woolly mammoths went extinct thousands of years ago, but could they ever walk the earth again? That's the plan behind a company called Colossal. They received $15 million in private funds to continue work bringing the woolly mammoth back to life. The company's head, Harvard Medical School biologist George Church, had been working on the project on a small scale for nearly a decade when they were awarded the massive investment. The idea is that they're going to be taking elephant DNA and edit individual genes to add, subtract, and tweak elements that would give these new creatures the traits of the woolly mammoth. These include their heavy fur coats, fat stores, and ability to thrive in extreme cold. Love Dalen, a professor of evolutionary genetics at the Center for Paleogenetics in Stockholm, has several details on the effort. Dalen says the work has merit, particularly in re-establishing genetic diversity in endangered species. But there's a catch. The genetically engineered creatures aren't technically mammoths, but are instead airy elephants. So the hopes of releasing them into the Arctic and rebalancing the ecosystem are unproven. Cave lions were massive predators that roamed Europe and Asia until about 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. Bigger than today's lions, they weighed up to 800 pounds when grown and counted cave bears among their prey. It's not clear why they went extinct, but the discovery of a handful of well-preserved individuals has got scientists wondering about the potential for the resurrection of the species. Recently, a couple of two-month-old cubs were discovered that researchers named Boris and Sparta. The pair were recovered in eastern Russia. They lived around 15,000 years apart. The younger and more physically intact cave lion is Sparta, who would have lived just under 28,000 years ago. The young cave lions were so intact that they were almost immediately questions about using them to bring their entire species back. It was an endeavor that Dr. Albert Protopavo suggested would be even easier than bringing back a mammoth. He has said, Cave and modern lions separated only 300,000 years ago. In other words, they are different species of the same genus. It would be a revolution and a payback by humans who helped extinguish so many species. The moa was a group of giant, flightless birds that were driven to extinction thanks to overhunting from humans. The little bush moa was one of nine different species and it made headlines in 2018. That's when researchers from Harvard University completed the first step in de-extinction. The scientists completed a full genome of the bird using DNA taken from the toe bone of a little bush moa. It was no small feat. DNA starts decaying from the time of death. Reconstructing DNA is often described as sort of like taking a shattered glass and trying to piece it back together. Only in this case, the research team was dealing with 900 million nucleotides, the base building blocks of DNA and millions of DNA fragments. These needed to be pieced together to build a genome. Failure is not an option. Skeptics, however, have cautioned about the practicality of this for several reasons. First, there has to be a large number of individuals created to allow a wild population to support itself without inbreeding and collapse and the environment has changed in the 600 years since extinction. The result could be an animal inherently maladapted to the modern world. Meanwhile, other groups suggest that funds would be better spent protecting the endangered animals that are still around, like the kiwi. The island of Pinta in the Galapagos was ruined by humans. In 1959, fishermen put three goats on the island, thinking they'd produce offspring as a food supply. Unfortunately for everything already on the island, the goats produced around 40,000 offspring by 1970, which destroyed the ecosystem. The tortoise that would become known as Lonesome George was moved to the island's tortoise sanctuary, but after repeated attempts to find him a suitable mate failed, he died in 2012. It was believed he was the last of his kind, but now science has good news. In 2020, conservationists had found a female relative of Lonesome George's. She's a direct descendant of the same species. After she was discovered, the team also found 18 other females and 11 males who were hybrids of two species, the Pinta Island tortoise and the extinct Floriana Island tortoise. It's also believed that there are more such hybrids, carrying the DNA of their extinct ancestors. The newly discovered genomes include that of the female who shared 16% of her genes with Lonesome George. Hopefully, it will provide enough genetic material for conservationists to start a selective breeding program to resurrect the Pinta and Floriana tortoises. Humankind's awe of the auroch is well recorded. The ancient cattle weren't just the subject of countless prehistoric cave paintings. They are also mentioned in the writings of Julius Caesar, who called them extraordinary. Like so many species, they were a casualty of human activity. Hunting, domestication, and the habitat loss that came with the spread of agriculture meant the end of these magnificent primordial oxen. The last wild one died in 1627. That may change in a pretty amazing way. Conservationists concerned about the future of wild animals in Europe have proposed a massive rewilding scheme. Rebuilding aurochs and reintroducing them to the wild is part of that. The idea is pretty straightforward. 
Aurochs disappeared in part because they bred with domesticated cattle. As a result, some of their genetic material and traits live on. By selectively breeding for those traits, it's hoped that an entire species of Aurochs will be distilled of those cattle. There was a calf born in March of 2020. His name was Darwin, and he marks the so-called Generation F3, which will be the parent generation of offspring that researchers hope to call very, very close to their ancient ancestors. There have been plenty of cautionary tales about the dangers of messing with dinosaur DNA, but that hasn't stopped real-life scientists from giving it a go. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. The results have been interesting and disturbing at the same time. In 2016, researchers from the University of Chile decided to dive into the DNA of chickens. It turns out they didn't need dinosaur DNA to reverse engineer modern chickens into something more like their ancient ancestors. Basically, the scientists turned off a gene called IHH. It prevented that gene from halting the growth of the fibula. With that gene turned off, chickens grew bones that looked disturbingly like bones of the ancient Archaeopteryx. The Smithsonian said that something similar had been done a year prior. Paleontologists at the University of Chicago led a study to tweak chicken DNA to give embryos snouts instead of the standard beak. They were just trying to find out how beaks evolved in the first place, but with further advances, they might just have the tools to go one step further. In 2020, National Geographic reported on findings that came out of the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology in China. Researchers had found what looked like dinosaur DNA in the remains of a 75-million-year-old skull, and more DNA, this time from 120-million-year-old fossils, was potentially found in 2021. While researchers say they're far away from rebuilding an entire dinosaur, this could be the first step. The thylacine, or Tasmanian tiger, is definitely extinct. Still, that hasn't stopped the buzz about it, and in recent years, there have been more reported sightings of the thylacine than of Bigfoot and Elvis combined. It's given rise to a fascinating conversation about perception and interpretation of things like photographic evidence. But just as interesting is the fact that someday, people might see actual living thylacines again. This weird sort of marsupial dog only went extinct fairly recently. The designation was made official in 1982. The last captive animal died in 1936, and it's believed the last wild ones died in the 1940s. Examining DNA from a 108-year-old baby thylacine was meant to be an experiment that would hopefully determine how wolf-like they were. In 2008, scientists took that DNA, injected it into a mouse, and saw it function to guide bone and cartilage development. Then, in 2010, the preserved remains of a thylacine joey yielded enough DNA that researchers from the University of Melbourne called it the roadmap for getting the thylacine back. The goal is to rebuild the thylacine genome, gestate it in a surrogate or artificial womb, and see what is born. It used to be that the term quaha was used to refer to any zebra that had a specific and distinctive pattern of stripes. The quaha project says that helped lead to the very mistaken belief that there were many more of the animals than there actually were, and they were hunted into extinction. The last quaha died in an Amsterdam zoo in 1883. Since then, DNA analysis has proven that they were a separate subspecies of the plain zebra. Fast forward to the late 1980s and the start of an ambitious breeding project. The idea was to take closely related zebras selected for their quaha-like traits, like brown coats and a lack of stripes, and breed them in such a way that the traits would be accentuated in the next generation. Reinhold Rouse's pioneering work on the project was initially met with pretty wild disdain, but he carried on. The project's first foal was born in 1988, and these faux quahas are now named Rao quahas. As of 2021, the project was welcoming its next generations of foals. Entire breeding herds led by hand-selected stallions are currently producing their sixth generation, which the Quaha project says is getting closer and closer to the original animal. According to Trent University, passenger pigeons went from numbering in the billions, flying in flocks so large that they were once called a biological storm, to gone in just around 40 years. The last one died in 1914. Now, however, an organization called Revive and Restore is working on bringing them back. The idea is to take a flock of rock pigeons that have been engineered to include something called a Cas9 gene. Without getting too into the weeds regarding the science, that's a gene that allows for the use of a gene editing tool called CRISPR. Scientists plan on using the tool to add DNA from the extinct passenger pigeons to new generations of rock pigeons. In 2019, the program saw the birth of its first pigeon that contained the Cas9 gene. And while they found that it was unlikely he would pass the gene on to his offspring, it was a start. They are still toward the first new passenger pigeons to hatch in 2025. Not everyone is thrilled, though. Some ornithologists claim that it's not just unethical to de-extinct the pigeons, but it could be devastating to an environment that's no longer used to having them around. The story of the great auk is a pretty harsh one. This large, flightless bird was once plentiful, but as exploration allowed humankind to expand farther and farther into the bird's territories, it became easy prey. 
By the 16th century, it was clear that something needed to be done, and warnings not to hunt the birds just made the demand for their feathers and corpses increase. The last ones were killed in 1844, but they might be due for a return. The Research Institute Revive and Restore outlined a plan in 2016, and it involved tracking down preserved remains of great auks, finding and extracting DNA, then using that to rebuild the bird's genome. That DNA would be inserted into the embryos of a razorbill, the great auk's nearest living relative, which would then be implanted into another bird. That bird would have to be big enough to carry and lay a great auk egg, which is why the razorbill can't be the final destination for the embryo. Could it work? Like most attempts at resurrecting an extinct species, the answer is maybe. The good news is that they have the perfect place to test the theory, the already bird-centric Farns Island off Britain's east coast. The ancient steppe bison was a pretty big deal. One of the few megafaunas to survive through the last ice age, they spread from their native lands in Asia. From there, they crossed the land bridge into North America and gave rise to America's famous bison. In 2016, an ancient but well-preserved steppe bison tail was discovered in the permafrost around the Indigirka River Basin. Hmm, he's got a lab, but I don't hear a dub. Oh, ha, there it is. Researchers date that tail to around 8,000 years ago and are pretty sure it's intact enough that it'll yield some DNA. That DNA would then be used to create clone embryos of the steppe bison, which could be implanted into a cow. They estimate the baby born to the surrogate mother would be 99.8% newborn bison, but that's a bit down the road. Before trying it with a steppe bison, scientists say they first need to learn how the process works and if it's even viable. That means testing it. The successful cloning of a Canadian wood bison would have to be done before attempts were made at bringing back the steppe bison. It's nowhere near as flashy as a woolly mammoth, but it turns out that the restoration of the heath hen might be much more practical and possible. The conservation and de-extinction organization Revive and Restore is working on the heath hen project. They say it's notable as one of the first species that Americans actively tried to protect. Once widespread across the northern Atlantic coast, residents of Martha's Vineyard established a preserve for the only birds remaining in 1870. All their efforts were ultimately in vain, and the heath hen vanished in 1932. They're currently working on a few aspects of the de-extinction, and that includes figuring out where the heath hen fits in with living relatives on a genetic level. They're also trying to figure out what behavioral and biological traits made them different from other birds, and what genetic pathways those things are connected to. Then they need to figure out how to tweak embryos to produce these decades dead birds. The Smithsonian says that when George Wilhelm Steller saw and documented the existence of what would become the Steller's sea cow, it was almost extinct already, and it would only last a few more decades before it finally went extinct in 1768. Hunting played a big part in it. Researchers from Norway's Nord University managed to sequence the genome of a sea cow. They found that a long period of climate change had resulted in the species' slow decline. Today, Revive and Restore is looking at the sea cow as a potential candidate for de-extinction. The hope is that bringing back the sea cow will help stabilize an ecosystem and repair some of the damage done by extinction and by other factors. It's a massive undertaking, and while the 2021 sequencing of the sea cow genome means that one hurdle has been overcome, there are still other things to consider. The ecosystems have changed in the last few hundred years, so making sure that there's still a place for the sea cow is paramount. They also need to make sure that the factors that led to their extinction in the first place are no longer an issue. The Xerxes blue butterfly is an example of a creature that's small yet mighty. The butterfly was the first species that scientists were able to prove went extinct solely due to human interference. In this case, it was habitat loss. As populations grew out from the San Francisco area, the landscape was changed. Fields and sand dunes were turned to pavements, and native flowers disappeared. The Xerxes blue butterfly became a symbol of the damage humankind has done, and in 2021, conservationists got the news they were looking for. DNA extracted from a 93-year-old specimen from Chicago's Field Museum proved that people were to blame for the extinction. The Xerxes was one of the first recorded or documented cases of an animal going extinct or being driven to extinction by human causes. The butterfly's status as an icon for conservation has also gotten it attention as a candidate for de-extinction, thanks to recent developments in the field. In addition to exploring its DNA, there's another theory, too. Some scientists believe that thanks to a habitat restoration project, introducing a closely related butterfly might kickstart a re-evolution of the Xerxes. Still, Felix Gruy, Xerxes researcher and co-director of the Granger Bioinformatics Center, summed up everything that needed to go before de-extinction. Before we start putting a lot of effort into resurrection, let's put that effort into protecting what's there and learn from our past mistakes. The Pyrenean ibex, or bucardo, a type of Spanish goat that lived in the Pyrenees Mountains that border France and Spain, was on the verge of extinction in 2000, with only three females still alive. 
Once they died out, French and Spanish scientists harvested as much of their genetic information as they could and started a project to clone the animal. They succeeded in manipulating the DNA of a Bacardo and placing it into the embryo of a surrogate mother, a common goat. A baby was born on July 30, 2004, but died of respiratory issues minutes later. Not only was this a significant achievement in cloning technology, but it represented the first successful live birth of an extinct animal. Though the baby died, the experiment proved that de-extinction was possible. A new effort to return the Bucardo from extinction began in 2013 by the Center for Research and Food Technology of Oregon. One of the principal scientists behind the efforts began the process of determining if the 14-year-old genetic information obtained from the last living Bucardo is still viable. The sample has been frozen in liquid nitrogen since it was last used. So part of the project isn't just to bring back the Bucardo, but also to see if preserved material can be used after an extended period of time. If everything checks out, they'll attempt the cloning and breeding process all over again, and hopefully get more than a few minutes worth of success this time. The beautiful Carolina parakeet was the only parrot indigenous to the United States. At one time, the parakeet was prevalent all across the North American continent, but it was declared extinct in 1939. It had an obnoxiously loud call and would eat the seeds and crops of farmers, which explains why farmers so aggressively killed them. The crazy broad grabs the gun and tries to shoot me! Me! Crackers! Because why are you talking? How can a bird be talking? Efforts to revive this extinct animal have followed similar plans to breed dormant genes into other extinct species. The closest known relative is the Jandaya parakeets from the eastern South American rainforests. Crossbreeding programs as well as attempts to isolate the genetic code and introduce it into a Jandaya embryo are underway. If successful, the Carolina parakeet will likely settle on the shores of Lake Okeechobee in Florida. Researchers plan to introduce 100 birds there once they've succeeded in breeding them in captivity. That is, assuming their annoying squawks don't quickly result in a second extinction. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more messed up history videos about exotic animals are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.